would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. It's a big honor for me. Um, I will talk about the in-feed antibiotics, the antibacterial resistance, and the alternatives to in-feed antibiotics and how this all affects the safety of animal products. Um, antibiotics have been used massively all over the world, as we all know, and again, as we all know, it started with uh, the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming, or better said, it started once their therapeutic effects were more recognized, uh, which was actually done by uh, giving the penicillin to the patients uh, with uh, the fire wound burns uh, according to one of the biggest fire accidents in the United States. And since those patients were giving the penicillin that were not recognized at that time, and the effect was so enormous and so, so good, the penicillin started to be called miraculous drug and the discovery and development of other antibiotics followed this pattern. Uh, and of course, antibiotics saved many lives. Uh, there is no doubt about it. But on the other hand, there is a problem of antibacterial resistance. We all know that uh, bacteria can get resistant to antib uh, antibiotics, and especially the underdosage of the antibiotics that is, or it's being used in the animal feed and in, uh, in the animal nutrition. Uh, even Alexander Fleming warned against the risk of antibacterial uh, antibiotic resistance in bacteria and it actually happened. Uh, this is the example for one group of antibiotics for one group of bacteria but uh, you can see this pattern more or less for each and every group of antibiotics. Uh, so this is the situation in 2000. 2002, and this is the situation five years later. You can see that the resistance is spreading out, and in 10 years, it's uh, even a little bit worse, as you can see. So it's still following. This is uh, the situation in Europe, but uh, you can guess this is more or less the uh, problem that is all over the, the planet. Not just for the treatment. Uh, we all know that the antibiotics are not used just for the treatment of uh, people and in the veterinary medicine, but they are used or they've been used in the animal nutrition to enhance the growth of the animals. Uh, it's the, the biggest reason. Of course, the, the more uh, effective is the feeding, the cheaper is the product. Um, there is also an issue of prevention of gastrointestinal inf infections, uh, specifically around the weaning period. The animals are uh, really sensitive to gastrointestinal infections, and those lower doses of antibiotics can uh, facilitate this problem. Uh, and consequently, once the animals are not that ill, the animal product is not in such a high risk of contamination like poultry in the slaughterhouse during the processing. There is the risk of contamination with salmonella, etc. Uh, so those are the feed supplement. This is not a treatment, but a supplementing of the feed with lower doses of antibiotics. Uh, they've been used worldwide since 50s of the last century, so not uh, just a long, long time after the antibiotics started to be used. Um, but as the resistance starting to spread, uh, spreading out, of course, this is the easiest way how to reduce the consumption of antibiotics to um, restrict the use of in-feed antibiotics because it's very... Um, hard to uh, stop using antibiotics in human, <laughs> the human medicine, of course. So antibiotics were restricted in, since January 2006. This is the situation in Europe. Uh, also in the United States, it's starting to get uh, to this situation. It's still voluntary so, uh, from last year, from uh, December of 2013. There is a voluntary act of um, not using in feed antibiotics. In Asia, it depends country to country. Uh, Korea and Taiwan, I think, are the further, the most further way, uh, how to say it, the, the closest to, to Europe, let's say it that way. Uh, so it's all over the world, this, uh, this problem is. Uh, of course, uh, once the 
infeed antibiotics were restricted, there is, uh, well, animals uh, does not uh, grow that effectively as before. Also, there is a higher risk of contamination of animal products, higher risk of gastrointestinal infections of animals. Of course, this all can be solved with a very good hygiene and a good management. This is the best way how to do it. Uh, of course, uh, antibiotics and infeed antibiotics are like the facilitators and maybe masking the bad, bad hygiene. Um, well, we can also help it by some alternatives. Uh, we are working in a couple of these areas, but I will just focus on organic acids or better said on medium chain fatty acids uh, due to the time and uh, so on. Uh, so, um, I will not talk about organic acids in general, like citric acid, lactic acid and so on. Uh, it's a wide range of, of chemicals and I will not focus on that. I will just talk about the medium chain fatty acids, so about four fatty acids, caprylic, capric, uh, caproic and lauric. Those are the fatty acids that are very high in contents in milk, in rabbit milk, in, in goat milk. Also, lauric acid is very high in coconut oil or park, palm kernel oil, so it's not just the animal products. Uh, first of all, I would like to give you a very short overview of the literature all over the world. I just chose two uh, scientific groups because of the time. Uh, first is the perfect example how the medium chain fatty acid can work as a dietary supplement. This is the group of uh, scientists from the United States and they used caprylic acid as the uh, feed uh, supplement for broiled chickens that were experimentally infected with Campylobacter jejuni, what is the highest cause uh, in uh, uh, food related infections uh, from, from chickens as you know. Uh, so they supplemented the, the poultry feed with caprylic acid in four uh, concentrations from uh, 0.35 till 1.4 percent and they did it uh, for quite short time I have to say uh, it was just the three day treatment or seven day treatment and you can see that the reduction of amount of campylobacters in, in cecum was very very high this is actually one of the those are actually one of the best results i've ever seen in the field and it's just after a three-day treatment of course the concentration was rather high uh, another uh, aspect or another group is from belgium and they uh, they didn't use the particular acid but the their natural um, the the natural ingredient in this uh, case it were uh, kufia seeds that are high in, uh, in uh, medium chain fatty acids. Uh, they didn't, they add 5% to the feed, which is quite high, and they didn't really see such a big differences. They were not significantly different. Uh, well, my explanation is that the piglets, they were giving it to piglets, were not that sick, let's say it that way. Uh, there was no experimental infection, so they were comparing um, less healthy with more healthy, but they were still rather healthy, so the effect was not that pronounced. Uh, however, it didn't do any harm as well. <laughs> so this is another, another um, way uh, to feed uh, the natural product itself, not just particular acid. But the coffee acids are really interesting. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, really to live in Europe is not really a good thing in getting the kufia seeds. They are big in the United States, but here in Europe it's quite a problem to get them, which is also my problem. So if you know someone who is growing kufia seeds, let me know. I would really like to have a, a small bag of it. Um, now I will focus on our experiments just really shortly. I will give you the short overview of just this first. Uh, first section of the experiments we are doing, which are the experimental infections of rabbits and chickens. Uh, this was the first uh, experiment we did. We uh, used caprylic acid or the triacylglycerol of those uh, with uh, capric acid together on broiled rabbits. And we experimentally infected them with enteropathogenic E. coli, the serotype O103 which is highly virulent and it's the biggest cause of uh, more mortality in rabbits, in broiler rabbits. 
nowadays. Um, we divided the animals into four groups. First was negative control, so they were not infected. And then, then we had the three groups that were infected. And one was given the control feed, second the feed with caprylic acid, and the third one with a mixture of triacylglycerols of uh, caprylic and capric acid. And we observed the, uh, the difference in bacterial shedding, in animal performance and health status. And what we saw was um, the significant effect. Uh, the first slope is the negative control, then there is the positive control, which are the ones that were fed the normal diet. And those two were the ones uh, feeding with uh, caprylic acid so, and capric acid. So you can see that the effect was uh, quite well pronounced. Uh, we confirmed this result with a less virulent strain. Uh, it was the serotype 0128, which is not that virulent. So at the first experiment, we had quite high mortality. So the results were a little bit masked behind this. But here, nobody died. So we could see a really beautiful, uh, beautiful differences due to the fact we had all the animals all the time of the experiment. Uh, the second uh, part uh, we did were the chickens, and I already mentioned I will talk about rabbits and chickens. So this is the second part. Uh, we did the experimental infection with Campylobacter jejuni and something rather similar like the uh, American group. The difference was in concentrations. We used the lower concentrations because they used quite high concentrations of the acids. And the second thing is that we used coated uh, product. The idea is that when you use the coated product, it reaches the distal parts of the intestinal system, which is the part where the Campylobacter is present. And this is the place where we want to reduce the Campylobacters because then during the processing of poultry, there is of course lower risk of contamination of the animal product, so of the chicken meat. Uh, so we did more or less similar or a very similar pattern like the last time. We sampled the feces of the chickens every second or the third day. We did the infections two times just to mask the natural conditions in, uh, in the field. And what we see, this is a quite busy table, so I will just uh, lead you over this uh, quickly. This is the protected group. And you can see that the group with protected fatty acids had this effect very well pronounced at the first days after the second infection. So there was actually quite nice uh, result all over the time and especially in the protected form of the acid. Of course, the protected form is more costly. Uh, this is the last, uh, last paper we published about this topic and this was the, well, we were thinking maybe we shouldn't uh, just feed the animals with uh, fatty acids, even though they are very safe. Uh, we could uh, try the second pattern uh, and just surface treat the, the product if we want to reduce the contamination of the animal product and we forget about the animals and we will think just about the health of the people, maybe we could just treat the, the product. Uh, however, of course, the, there is a problem with the dosage, with the concentration, because the medium chain fatty acids, I think you probably know the sm smell, it's not like a butyric acid, it's terrible, but, you know, caprylic acid and lauric acid, you can get that little smell. So we tried it, and well, however, it worked very well. There was that sensory trait that in the panel assessors who, who made it, they they recognized it in three tools uh, from five uh, sensory traits in skin. They didn't recognize it in meat, but well, you know, it's still, I wouldn't recommend it really. Uh, I would rather stay with the uh, with, uh, supplementation of the feed. Uh, so as a conclusion, uh, I can say uh, that the medium chef acids are just one of the alternatives uh, for reducing the contamination of animal products over the feed. Uh, of course, we can use another ones. The advantage of medium chain fatty acids is that they are rather safe. Uh, there is virtually no acute toxicity, so this is a good thing. Uh, of course, uh, there is a lower risk of the bacterial shedding and consequently lower risk of the contamination of the animal products. Uh, and they can be used uh, over the 
the food producing animals. So with this, I would like to thank you for your, for your attention. I hope I was fast enough. <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah, what, I can what, hear you. <laughs> yeah. So what, what is the mechanism of the meal chain uh, fatty acids in terms of bacterial decontamination? Is it through um, gut decontamination? Are there alterations in the gut microbiome as well that you are aware of? Yes, yes. Uh, we are uh, working on the alteration of the gut microbiome as well. But the, the mechanism of the action, it's still a question. The, there is a couple of theories why it works. Uh, the most general one is that the uh, fatty acids uh, enters the bacterial cell, there it dissociates and the hydrogen protons, uh, the bacterium needs to get rid of it and once uh, the bacterium is getting rid of the hydrogen protons, so she is or it is uh, putting them out of the cell, uh, it consumes the energy because it's the active transport, so this is, this is the highest accepted theory. Uh, however, we did some. Uh, the second is the lysis of the cell, but it's probably just when you use really high concentrations. Uh, we did some electron uh, micrographs and we didn't really see the, uh, the disruption of the membrane. So, but the, the cytoplasm was really disrupted or disorganized. So there is a second, another theory about the low pH in the cell that can affect the enzyme activity and so on. So there is a huge amount of theories, but the most accepted is the dissociation one with the transport of the hydrogen protons. But it affects uh, the microbiome as well, a little bit, yes. Any other question? But it's not, uh, you know, it's not selective, so you kill everything more or less in the so same would way. Affect, would affect other cell lines in the host, like uh, uh, epithelial cell, epithelial intestinal integrity? Yes, in this is what we are planning to do because finally we have a cell lab. Um, but uh, it's, I don't think it, it will affect because it's really not toxic at all. When you see the data sheet of the caprylic acid, there is the LD50 uh, uh, higher than two and a half grams, so it's listed among the grass, so the safe uh, chemicals. So I don't think it will affect, I want to try it just in case, but it's, it's listed as a safe.